the sixth birthday hymnals. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we'll keep the uh, we'll keep the bling. How about that? Or uh, what did you put it? What was that? What was it? So drip. Drip? Yeah. Okay. Drip that, that, to me, that has a whole biological meaning. <laughs> but you have to you have, you have, Oh, man. It takes a bit of sense. Okay. Is that a notebook? I'm just saying. Wait, why is your paper? Your paper's on mine. Sorry. I thought it was. Okay. So let's chit chat about some of these answers right quick. Yes, it's a jacked up schedule because it's on the Wednesday schedule. Uh, so your answer to number five uh, should be around 30-ish, okay? Now, when you get to number six, here's the whole key to number six. Your TV's not on. Oh, so demanding. <laughs> wear glasses, oh, no, no. have a ring. Oh, Mr. Burkhead, I have different numbers in the room. Is that a problem? <laughs> okay. So, here's the tree. We're going to make that the reference point. We're going to call that point A. Okay? You are not starting at the reference point. Okay? <laughs> Bobby the bicyclist is 250 meters away from the tree and he's going away from the reference point. How do you know that he's going away from the reference point? Because the positive. He has a yeah. positive velocity and he has a positive position, right? Uh -huh. right? So that means he's going away from the reference point. So on that initial set, he's going at a positive 5 meters per second. And I know that's his velocity because it has two things. It has magnitude and it has direction. So not only do I know how fast he's going, I know which direction he's going. So he's going to travel at that speed for like 30 seconds. So what you want to pay attention to is the terminology. You want to keep track of how far did he go from where he started and then how far is he all the way from that tree. So there's got two different concepts that are going to be happening. So anyway, so he's going to go out here, and he's going to end up at 400 meters away. Because he was already 250, he's going to go another 150, so he's going to end up at 400 meters. At that point, he realizes, man, I left my gold chain with the dollar sign <laughs> hanging on the tree. i got to go back. Right? So he's going to turn around and he's going to go back. Now, as soon as he changes direction, what happens to the sign of his velocity? It changes and becomes negative. That's how we know that he changed direction, right? And because he didn't want somebody to steal his gold dollar sign, he's going faster backwards because he's going backwards at negative 10. So your position time graph is going to look something like this, okay? So he's going to start at 250, he's going to go to 400, and then he's going to go all the way back to the reference point, okay? Now, one of the things that you want to calculate is how long that's going to take. Now, this is very specific when you look at the sign of this deal. So you can't have negative time. So you want to figure out how long it's going to take him to go from where he turns around all the way back to the reference point. And so this is where you look at displacement. Because displacement is position final minus position initial. When he goes back, what's his final position? Zero. What's his initial position? 400. So his displacement on the way back is going to be negative 400 meters. Okay? The distance he traveled would be 400, but his displacement is going to be negative 400. Here's the significance of that, is that you want to find time, which is going to be displacement divided by velocity. So if you just take, and this is technical, but it's important. If you just take 400 meters and divide that by negative 10 meters per second, what's the sign of your time? Negative. You would have negative time. Okay? Oh, that's awkward. 
Okay? Okay? Now, there's two ways to approach this. You can just ignore it and go, mm, whatever, okay? You're going to miss the whole point of the problem. But if you look, if you work the problem holistically and go, oh, that's negative 400 meters divided by negative 10 meters per second, then you still end up with positive time, okay? So if you randomly end up with a negative sign for time, just don't ignore it, okay? You have missed some big idea along the way. Okay? So that should take care of that problem. Your answer to number seven, the distance traveled by a beam of light in a year should be a really big number. Should be something times 10 to the 15th. Okay? So that's it. So if you could travel at the speed of light from an entire year, that's how far you can travel. Now the nearest star, Proxima Centaurus, is about 2.3 light years away. So even if you could travel at the speed of light to get to the nearest star, it would still take you over two years. Okay, both your answers to number eight should be something times 10 to the third, okay? Make sure your answer to number nine somehow involves the word instantaneous. And if you read your answer and you don't have the word instantaneous, just don't write instantaneous at the end and go, oh, here you go, okay? That's not the point. Now, let's talk about, say, for example, number 10, okay? So on number 10, you're saying... Here's going to be this lightning strike, which is going to superheat the air, which is going to make the thunder, and that sound is going to expand at 3.3 whatever times 10 to the second meters per second. And you are uh, 1.609 kilometers away. You want to know how long it's going to take for you to hear that sound. So let's just think this through. Okay, first off, you have this in kilometers and you have that in meters per second. So right away, why is that problematic? Yeah, units aren't going to work out, okay? So you either change the kilometers into meters or you change the sound into kilometers per second. Most people change this into meters, it's 1,609, multiplied by 1,000. So we got 1,609 meters, okay? Now... This is why it's sometimes handy to view this in terms of a ratio. So this number here in round numbers is about 330 meters per second. So understand what that means. It's a rate function. It means that for every second that goes by, this sound travels 330 meters. Okay, that's what that means. Okay. Now, is the distance that you're going to travel Bigger or smaller than 330 meters? Bigger. bigger. So what does your time have to be bigger than? One, One second. second. So right away, you know if you get your answer to number 10, and you have an answer less than one second, you've done something horribly wrong. Okay? So that's why, even if you don't work it as a proportion, it's handy to visualize that thought process and go, wow, I got 330 meters per second. I got to travel over 1,000 meters. My time has to be bigger than one second. Because here's invariably what you do wrong on a problem like this. And you all sit there and go, you Mr. Burkamp, please don't do that. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to take 330 meters per second, and you're going to divide that by 1,609 meters. This is what you're going to do wrong. And you all sit there and go, Mr. Burkamp, it's your birthday. We promise, happy birthday, we won't do that. So, and here, and in your mind, you're going to go, oh, the meters cancel out and I get seconds. <laughs> okay? <laughs> do you get seconds? No. You're like, what do you actually get? One over seconds. You get one over seconds. And one over seconds is not seconds. Okay? But if you do it right, and you take the meters and divide it by meters per second, then the meters cancel out, the seconds flip up on top, miracle of miracles, you get the correct time. So your answer to number 10 should be, and this is an ish around five, and your answer to number 11 will make a horrible GPA. <laughs> okay, horrible GPA. Uh, make sure on... Uh, number 12, like on that D, I said, what's the object ever at constant velocity? Explain. 
So the answer should be yes, by the way. But then tell me, how do you know that that was a constant velocity? Now, let's talk about that last velocity time graph on number 13, because this is going to play out on the lab that you're going to need to do today. So this looks something like this, and then you got some dipsy doos, and okay. So here's the velocity, here's time. Now, everybody, everybody gets the idea that it's speeding up. Okay, so starting from rest, you're speeding up, you have positive velocity, you have positive acceleration. If you're into signs, go with that approach. If you'd like to say, oh, here's zero meter per second, I'm, I'm going away from zero meters per second. If you like that approach, that's cool. I don't care. Signs are good. Then you're at a constant velocity, there's no acceleration. And then you start to slow down. And everybody's cool with that one. Okay? Slowing down. Here's the most common misconception. Zenodra says, oh, I'm slowing down this entire time. Okay? Nick, you shake your head emphatically no. Why? Um, because once you change direction and it looks like it goes down, and it's, you're accelerating just in another direction. Bingo. As soon as you cross through zero meters per second, what are you actually doing? Changing you're direction. speeding up. You I'm can't go slower than zero. Okay? I've seen freshmen out in the hallway all week trying to do it. They can't even go slower than zero. Once you cross zero, what do you have to do? Speed up. Okay, now did you change direction? Yeah, because you went from positive to negative velocity. So listen to me in terms of the lab that you're going to do today. You're going to see a car change direction. It's going to bounce off of a wall. Okay? When that car bounces off of a wall, you're going to go from slowing down to speeding up. Okay? So when you get down to the lab today, when you do your analysis, when you, that line crosses through zero, that means that that thing is going to speed up. Okay? So keep that in mind. Now, if you like signs, you're going to have a negative velocity and you're going to have a negative acceleration. Your velocity and acceleration have the same sign. You're going to speed up. That's the other way that you can view it. Okay? Up here, you have positive velocity. Whoa. What is wrong with my Positive velocity and negative acceleration. So up here, you have positive velocity, negative acceleration, and you are slowing down. Here you have negative velocity, negative acceleration, and then you are speeding up. True or false? You can change direction with constant velocity. False. False. Why? Because when you're at constant velocity, you're slowing to just zero, and so you're kind of changing. Yeah. If you're at constant velocity, guess what? Your velocity vectors aren't changing. Okay? So that you cannot change direction with constant velocity. True or false? You can change direction with uniform acceleration. Bless you. Uh, true. 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 Yeah. That's what happens right here. Okay? You have uniform acceleration because it's the same slope the entire time. You throw something up in the air. Okay? So from the second that ball leaves my hand until it lands, that has uniform acceleration. My velocity vectors are getting smaller on the way up. They're getting bigger on the way down. So I can change direction with uniform acceleration, but I can't change direction with constant velocity. Okay? See the difference between the two? Yes. Got it? Good, Grant? Okay. Get that hand to them. Stop that young camera. Yes, Maggie? Talk about number six. So here's the deal. So you're ask, I'm asking you about a position time graph, right? True, Maggie? Yes. Okay. So, this thing is being stupid. So here's some random position time graph that looks like, I don't know, this. Okay? So let's start with the units, all right? Let's just, let's look at the units. What units is that position going to be measured in? <coughs> what units of time going to be measured in? Seconds. Seconds. So let's say this thing was actually a rectangle. Okay? Let's say it was actually a rectangle. 
If I multiplied, let's say, 5 meters by 10 seconds, what would I get? Well, my answer would be 50, but what units would I have? Uh, nope. Meters. Nope. I'd have meter seconds, right? Yeah. Now, now, what's measured in meter seconds? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay? This is like talking to a freshman that has no meaning. <laughs> okay? Seriously. Because the, the units don't work out. Okay, you can find the area, but it has no meaning. Now, if it was a velocity time graph, then you would have meters per second times seconds. Then you would get meters. Then that would have meaning. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No one's going to try solar. Okay, get that handy. Okay. <laughs> you got your relax. So here's what you're going to do in this lab. We're going to apply what we figured out to kind of a dynamic moving situation. So the big picture is that you're going to take the cart and it's going to roll along the wall or along the floor. It's going to hit the wall and it's going to bounce back. Okay, so that's going to be your motion. Point, point, back. Okay, I want to, I want to draw the position time graph and the velocity time graph for that motion. But let's start with, let's start with a simple idea first. And this is this pre-lab that's up there at the top. So we're just going to collectively do that together, kind of in the name of time, since we went out and had to see the thing. All right. <laughs> so imagine this. I'm just going to push this cart, okay? And this is going to be the reference point. And we're then listen to me. We're not going to include the push. We're going to start this analysis after it has left my hand, okay? So here's the reference point. This is zero. It's going to roll along, it's going to slow down a little bit, and then I'm just going to stop it. Okay? So we're here, it's going to roll, stop. So what would the position time graph and the velocity time graph look like for that motion? Assuming that it's slowing down just a little bit as it rolls. It's slowing down? It's slowing down just then a little it bit. It is an upper lip. Yeah. So there's the position yeah. time. There's your velocity time. The velocity time is not going to start at zero, zero, because it's already moving. Okay? So what would the let's start with the velocity time. What would that look like? The so time. here's my velocity time graph. It's already moving, right? It's going to slow this down a little bit, and then it's going to, bam, stop. Then what's it going to do? Drop to zero. Drop to zero really quickly, right? Now, remember, what does the slope of a velocity time graph give you? Acceleration. acceleration. So I had a tiny little, I had a little bit of acceleration as it's rolling, and then bam, big acceleration, right? Now, if you look at F equals MA, if you want big acceleration, what do you have to have? Small, wait, no. Big, big, no. big force, right? Big force gets big acceleration. Small force gets small acceleration. I was going to say small mass, but <laughs> saying that force is constant, you know. Now, what would but the position mind. time graph look like? Assuming that we're starting at the reference point. Um, the point that I let go of it, Preston, what does this mean? Oh, I'm going to have the glasses on that. Oh, you want to? Yeah, I'll do the Mick Jagger. Look at the cameras. I just figured out who Mick Jagger was the other day. Yeah. Come on, go on. I'm Mick Jagger. I've got a huge mitts. Okay. So you say it's going to be the upper lip, right? So something like this. Now, as soon as I stop it, what does it do? Straight line? Vertical? Horizontal? Horizontal. Horizontal. Okay, so this would be rolling along, boom, I stop it, flat line, right? I can't do that. Okay, cool with this. Now, if I were to measure this area underneath that velocity time graph, what would that represent? Displacement. It would be how far the cart rolled before I hit it. Okay, cool with that. Now, I'm going to change it up. I'm going to do the same thing. It's going to roll, it's going to hit. And then it's going to bounce back. Okay? 
So is the velocity time graph still going to look the same at the beginning? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Why, Cooper? You say that with utmost confidence. Because it's doing the same motion. It's doing the exact same motion, right? Okay, now, but it gets to this point, and the spring is compressed. Okay? Now, at this point, we haven't talked about energy, but here's a very brief energy lecture. There's two general classifications of energy. There's potential energy and kinetic energy, okay? Mother Nature hates potential energy, okay? Snapchat, Instagram, somebody said something about somebody on some social media. Mother Nature and potential energy don't like each other, okay? Mother Nature much prefers kinetic energy, kinetic energy from Greek to kinesis, which means motion, okay? So Mother Nature likes kinetic energy, she likes motion, much more than she likes potential energy, which is true. Like if I hold this up and I drop it, what happens? It's moving. It's moving. You change from potential energy into kinetic. So when Mother Nature hits and, and we store energy in the spring, that's storing potential energy in the spring because it's being compressed. Mother Nature goes, mm, no, I want to go back to kinetic energy. If Mother Nature liked potential energy, what would happen? It, it would hit and then it would it would just stay there. Mother Nature goes, ah, oh, potential energy, I like you. Let's chill out. Okay? She goes, no, no, no. I want kinetic energy. So it's going to come in, it has kinetic, store some potential, and then it goes back. So does the cart change direction? Yeah. Yes. yes. The cart changes direction. So what does your velocity time graph have to do? It has to go through zero. zero. Is it going to go through zero pretty? Is it going to take long for that thing to change the direction? No. No, it's going to happen. And then you can remember this on the lab. That change in direction is going to happen in about two tenths of a second. It's going to happen very, very rapidly. So, what's my velocity time graph going to look like when it comes in, hits, and bounces back? It's still, going to, it's still not going to start at zero, zero, right? The velocity is going to So go it's still going to start at some positive velocity, and then what's it going to do? Go through zero. It's going to slow down a little bit, right? So we're going to slow down a little bit, and then all of a sudden, bam, hits the wall. What was this? Bam, bam. okay? Bam meaning graphically we're going to draw a line down like this, Okay. So physically, what took place to start to slow that down? What did it do? It hit the wall. So it hit the wall at this point because here's the deal. Force equals mass times acceleration. If you're going to change the acceleration, what do you have to do? You have to change the force, right? So does the force change when it hits the wall? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right? It's the wall. Right? So at this point, this thing is slowing down, and it's slowing down rapidly. Okay? Now, at this point, at zero, the spring is fully compressed. Okay? We're like this. Okay? That spring is fully compressed. Mother Nature has a decision to make. She goes, I leave it like this, or I project it back in the opposite direction. Mother Nature goes, hmm, nah, I don't like you. That's your energy. Screw you. We're going back to kinetic. So Mother Nature goes, oh, we're going to change it back to kinetic. So how am I going to show a change in direction with this thing bouncing back? What's that line going to do? Past the zero. Velocity. Dime, what did you just say? You go past the zero point. Oh, it's going to go past the zero point, right? We? Oui. Oui. Is this French? We. Oui. OK. Well, right now. Do we even have French in England? Mm -hmm. no, uh, you got to go to May South. That's what I Yeah. Miss Fisher is not the French teacher. She teaches oh. in English. Okay. Now, so here's what I want you to think through. Topher, what is happening right there to make that cart speed up? That's true. But what's making you, you it is a spot on answer. But what is physically happening? To make that cart speed up, what's the spring doing? 
Yeah, or expanding, right? So that we compress the spring to slow it down. When the spring expands, that speeds it up. So here the spring is expanding, okay? Now, at this point, it's going to leave the wall. As soon as it leaves the wall, what does it begin to do? Slow down. It begins to slow down because there's a little bit of friction. So at this point, we're going to, this is when it is going to leave the wall. Okay, which is horrible. I just go see. But it's like it's not writing consistently. So that says leave, trust me, okay? It's not it's modern art. Okay? So that says leave. Okay, something close to that. So here's what happens. We're rolling. We hit the wall, bam! We store potential energy, or kinetic energy as potential. Mother Nature doesn't like it. Mother Nature says, ooh, we're going to expand that spring. Then it's gonna leave the wall at this point. Then it's gonna do one of two things. It's either gonna slope up towards zero, or it's gonna slope away and come down like that. Slope up towards zero. Why? Because it's slowing down. If you, if you send that line down like that, what are you saying it's doing? Yeah. Which would be cool, okay? Which would be cool. Because you're gonna say it's gonna hit the wall, the spring's going to expand, and then it's gonna roll, and then it's gonna keep speeding up. Which would be cool, okay? Not gonna happen, but that would happen. Now, so here's the deal. I want you to think through this. On the way in, when is the cart going as fast as it's ever going to go? At the beginning. At the beginning. Yes. Because there's going to be, yeah, and by the way, when you do this lab, make sure you do this with the wheel side down. Don't try and do it like that, okay? It's like, Mrs. Burkham, your lab is horrible, okay? Poor knob, suck it over. Okay. Oh, that works a lot better. Okay. So, you're going to, it's going to be going as fast as it's going to go on the way in. When is it going as fast as it's going to go on the way back? Once it hits, it's like right after it hits your hand. Yeah, as soon as that plunger leaves your hand or leaves the wall, that's when it's going to be going as fast as it's going to go. Okay, now, there's like 26 of you. I need big groups, like five or six in a group, okay? So this is where this is going to take some teamwork. Get your phones. We're well, not right now. But you're going to have your phones. You're going to use your phones and your stopwatches. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to go... Find a wall, that's not the difficult part. And you're gonna make you're gonna take a piece of tape and you're gonna put that measure out back one and a half meters, and you're gonna put down a piece of tape. Then you're gonna measure another one and a half meters and you're gonna put down another piece of tape. So what's gonna happen is that this second piece of tape is three meters from the wall. So we're gonna call this the reference point. Okay? This is gonna be the beginning. So Gonna, here's the wall, right? So you're gonna have a piece of tape here at one and a half, and you're gonna have another piece of tape here at zero, okay? Which is three meters away. Got that visual, two pieces of tape. So you can take the cart, and you're gonna give that a push, and it's gonna roll in, it's gonna hit that, it's gonna bounce back, like so. Okay. Now, this is not NASCAR. You do not, do not get bonus points for doing this close to the speed of sound. Okay? <laughs> Tough to get good data that way. You go, oh, seriously? Okay, so here's why this takes about five people. So, you might have Cooper timing it from zero to one and a half. Now, what you have to be careful of is that you all, all of you have to go off the same point, which is the front edge of this plunger. So Cooper's going to start his timing when it goes from zero, and he's going to stop his when it crosses the one and a half meter mark. Okay. Dime is going to chop, is going to time it from one and a half meters until the cart is fully stopped against the wall. Okay. Got that. Taylor is going to time it from when it's at the wall. Back to one and a half. Now, what's critical is that Taylor is not going to stop her stopwatch until the front edge of that cart 
gets back across that tape, okay? Not with this edge, but with this front edge here. Then, Mr. Hausman is going to, Michael's going to change it, time it from one and a half back to zero. So you can have four people time it. Zero to one and a half, one and a half to three, three back to one and a half, one and a half back to zero, okay? Then you're going to have Eli timing the entire thing. So when you add together all of the times, they should add up to within about a tenth of a second of what Eli timed it as the entire thing, okay? So on your data tape, which time, you're going to have four time intervals, which time do you think should be the smallest? Zero to one and a half. That's when you're going fast. Now, make sure that that part is already moving when it crosses that mark. Don't include the push, okay? Now, you have a column there that says elapsed time. And I'm just going to make up the numbers. So let's say that first one is one second and the next one is 1 1.2 seconds, okay? So here's what's most critical. You're going to keep a running total of your times, okay? So on that second column, at the end of this interval, you're at 2.20 seconds, okay? Whatever it is when you add those together. That's how long it took to get to the wall, okay? Now, that's, listen to me, that's when your velocity is going to go to zero. That is the most critical time that you have to have. So if this is my data, your position time graph is going to look something like this. There you are at three meters, that's going to be 2.20 seconds. On that velocity time graph, which is going to look something like this, doink, 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 that's going to be 2.20 seconds. So whatever you have, listen to me, whatever you have as the sum of that second column, that's when that position time graph breaks over zero, and that's when your velocity time graph goes to zero, okay? That's the most critical state. Now, you're going to have to calculate displacement. How do you calculate displacement? What minus what? Position minus final minus position. initial. On the way in, what's your initial position? Zero. zero. What's your final position? Zero. One and a half. Okay. Then you can go from one and a half to three. Then you can go from three to one and a half. Then you can go from one and a half to zero. Is your velocity going to change sign? Yes. So here's the key assumption that we're going to make. To get the velocity over an interval, we're going to assume that over that short of interval, our velocity is relatively constant. So to get your velocity, you're going to take your displacement, which on that first one would be one and a half meters, divided by one second, you get one and a half meters per second. You should end up with two positive velocities, and you should end up with two negative velocities. Notice in big bold letters I said be sure to show any calculations. You should have four calculations. Excuse me, you should have eight calculations. Four calculations of displacement, something minus something, and then you should have four calculations of velocity and displacement divided by time. Okay, we got about 15 minutes. Get your data, okay? Don't worry about the analysis. Focus on getting the data. Get yourself